you know, it's kind of amazing when it comes to stock markets, like the darkest hour is right before the dawn. Um, at the beginning of last week, right before we actually recorded this podcast, you literally had the most dire economic forecast out there. It just looked so bleak, even though the economic data was pretty good, you know, markets just kept selling relentlessly. And then bam, just like that, we had six days up in the market. <laughs> you know, it's just the markets are so cruel, right? When it gets everyone to believe one thing that, uh, you know, it can't go up again, uh, it goes on a massive rally. And that's why market timing in general is just so hard to do. Well, you know, what? I've been talking to a lot of my clients this past week, and they're all getting pretty upset because they're getting their October statements, which doesn't include that run up that you're talking about, Rye. And uh, I've been saying to them, I said, you know, did you did you guys think that the guy that still wears his varsity letter high school jacket to the uh, to the reunion is cool? And of course, they all say no. I said, well, guess what? You guys are just like him. You're living in the past. <laughs> That's is, it Bob, is it Bob still wearing his his varsity track jacket from uh, Lance to Alden? Oh yeah, I mean, hey, that was uh, that was a big purchase for me back then. Um, but you know what? The hardliners don't give it up, right? The most widely anticipated recession of all time. Is still on a table. It's you know it's still we're still waiting for Godot. In spite of the fact we just had a huge GDP number, you know they say, oh, it's I'm not I'm not wrong. I'm just early. It's not going to happen now in 2023. Guess when it's going to happen, guys? Next year. Yeah, right. Well, that's that's the part that's really hard is because really a week ago the economic data was great. Now, however, we had a war going on in the Middle East that had just started, so you had uncertainty there. Um, but all the numbers that you wanted to see. Uh, come in, whether it was softer or stronger, it did that. The, the market didn't react at all, but it did a week later. <laughs> so yeah. it's just, you know, it never really lines up with the data. And I always find that funny when I was like, well, I'm not going to make a move until I hear what that jobs report is or until yeah. I see what the earnings report is. But investing just doesn't work that way. It's counterintuitive. It moves when you don't think it's going to move. Um, and typically the other way of what you think it's going to do. Yeah, that's true. You know, in talking to a lot of our clients, you know, especially clients now that have bonds coming, coming due, you know, we've got lots of cash to put back to work and everybody's like, well, no, we should just sit tight here. It's kind of like, we want to sit in the foxhole where we're getting bombed. No, we want to get out of those foxholes and we want to fight and get that cash reinvested. Yeah. Because, you know, in the long run, right. And, and everybody, in order to meet their goals, first of all, they usually need at least some equity like returns in the portfolio, but we also need a balance of that portfolio is why we buy high quality bonds that come due. Um, you know, you, you want to get that income, lock that income up, you know, because if you like a 5% yield, lock it up for 10 years, you know, or five years. Um, when you look at the municipal bond rates, the yields are good. And dividends are being increased, right? Our pipeline index just went X dividend today. Um, they've increased that dividend twice in the last three quarters. So we have an increasing yield investment that, oh, by the way, is at an all-time record high, guys, even though this market's yeah. in a bear market, according to some pundits. Yeah, it's like, how could everything be so bad and we're becoming more profitable? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it's actually kind of a cool experiment. Bob and I did our, our fireside chat last week, which we do periodically, especially when markets are bad and people are ready to like jump off a cliff, um, which is typically the best time to buy, by the way. Markets went straight up after that call. But, you know, everyone's comparing, well, stocks have competition with bonds now because I can lock into a long-term treasury bond getting 4.5%, 5%. Well, it's not a fair comparison. You know, Bob and I went back and we looked at one of our dividend-paying portfolios, which 13 years ago paid 3%. Well, based on your initial investment today, it pays 7% because dividends go up over time, whereas if you lock into a bond, you get that same yield every single year. Wait a minute, Ryan. I'm on my screen right now. I plugged in the symbol. It says it only yields 3%. Yeah, <laughs> based on today, right? But based on the price 10 years ago, 13 exactly. years ago, and that's the yeah. point. It's, yeah. a, it's like, well, it's it's the carrot yield isn't your yield, right? In other words, it's a, it's a yield on purchase that increases every year, which means the reason that the dividend yield looks the same is because your value of your portfolio is going up, uh, which is sometimes like some kind of an abstract concept that a lot of folks can't grasp. But, you know, where we are right now isn't the new normal. It's the old normal, right? The old normal where we have a 10-year treasury that yields between 4 and 5%, where, you know, we have GDP growth that averages 2% a year. Um, you know, we're back to normal. And it's, it's, it's amazing that the pundits don't seem to understand that. You know what? Actually, I want to I go back to something we talked about it a little bit ago. You know, we, we did have that fireside chat last week. And, you know, I did notice going back to every time we had one of those that the market did recover. So... You know, I think whenever the market's going down, we just have a fireside chat, and that should fix everything. Huh. Well, that, that shows to show you then, Chris, that market timing works. So you should time all of your 
purchases based on uh, emergency fireside chats. The, the classic yeah. fireside rally, we'll call it. I like that. I like that. Now he jinxed it. So now it's not going to yeah, work. Now anymore. it's never going to work again. Thanks, <laughs> but also, you know, I think what's interesting is, is just how markets go to the brink and then everyone's expectations are basically what just happened. Like, look at oil prices a couple of weeks ago. It was a foregone mm -hmm. conclusion oil was going to 100. Well, it went over 90, and all of a sudden now, as we're recording this, it's under 80, <laughs> you know? Right. And look at the 10-year Treasury. It hit 5%. Everyone said, well, it's going to 6%. And then, bam, just like that, Jay Powell spoke. He talked about you know, maybe more dovishly than he's spoken in the past. And all of a sudden, you went from 5% to like 4.5% in the 10-year Treasury in a couple days, <laughs> you know? So... This is, again, why you have to position your portfolio for the future, because when those turns happen, they happen so quickly, you just can't account for it. Well, the problem is, is it's emotional. And, you know, people care about their money. They're emotional about money. Money is emotional. And, you know, if you go back and look through history, most individual investors sell the most when the market's at its lowest point for that period. And they buy the most when the market's at the highest point during that period. And you just look at the sentiment indicators, right? In July, when we hit, you know, a new recovery high for the year, right? Whether we were at the high for the year at 4,600 in the S&P, you know, there was very bullish sentiment. And you take the same investors three months later where the market's on sale and they're the most pessimistic they've been in two years. <laughs> Forget about just individuals. I mean, look at the big banks, Morgan yeah. Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, both called you know, only a week ago. They called for the markets to go much lower Earnings were going to continue. We're going to start to disappoint, and of course, as soon as they came out with those uh, those announcements, the market went the other way. I mean, how cruel are stocks? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, like... I'm still waiting for that uh, hurricane that Jamie Dimon predicted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was on the horizon, Chris. Somehow it blew itself out. But you know, it, it's it, it's like it's almost as if every pundit is really a native Philadelphian because you know, in Philadelphia, we look <laughs> at the glass as half empty, and we want to know you know who screwed us out of the other half. Um, so it, it's like they're, they're permanent bears, permanent pessimists. Um, and the thing is, you know, we've been accused of being very optimistic because we are, but we look at the facts and we look at the data and the data says we just had a 4.9% GDP. The data says that earnings are at all time record highs. I mean, I, my clients can't believe that when I tell them that we're going to have a year where the country's made more in profits than ever in the history of the country. And the market's supposed to be down. Oh, and by the way, you know, if you go, if you went into this quarter, most analysts thought we were going to see zero profits, and profits were up two percent. So I think you know the message here is, is the hurdle's been just too low for too long. And we always say this, but markets trade between reality and perception, and the perception has been just way too negative, and reality's coming in a lot better now. Markets are readjusting to that, and I suspect that's going to continue. Because one thing we're seeing here is productivity is going up. And what that means is when productivity goes up, that means margins go up because people are more efficient. And you couple that with technology, that's a really great recipe for the next couple of years. And that could be the big surprise, right? The big surprise next year. And, and I think that was the most important number of last week, guys, was the you know, non-foreign business productivity jumping 4.7% quarter over quarter. Because if that productivity number keeps growing, then the Fed can accept higher inflation. So 2% may not actually be the target. It may be 3%, and we're not that far from there. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 139, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. This is literally what Chris and Bob and I have been doing for a collective 75 years. But if you're thinking to yourself, I want a more hands-on approach, I want someone to look at my portfolio, look at my financial plan, well, here's your shot to do it. If you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We're going to give you a bird's eye view of your whole financial life and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how you're going to draw from your portfolio, how to take Social Security how to factor in inflation. Your costs are going to double over the next 20 years. You need a dynamic income plan to figure that out. We're going to put that together for you. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years, just going up and down, going nowhere? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We're going to put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it. 
over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you've saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. We've got a very special guest with us today, our colleague, financial advisor at Payne Capital Management, Miss Francesca Frankie Lagrateria. <laughs> Frank, great to have you on the show this morning. Hello. Uh, it's great to see you. Thanks. Great to have uh, great to have me. Yeah. <laughs> great to be on. <laughs> great to see grateful. you guys. <laughs> We're all very, very grateful. Um, and I thought, you know, a good topic we could talk about today is, you know, we work with a lot of couples doing financial planning. That's pretty much like the core of our, our firm here, paying capital management, what we do. But what we found is it can be very challenging to make sure that both spouses are on the same page. So I thought we could discuss how couples can kind of mess it up if they're not on the same page when we're doing financial planning. Well, I'll take the first one, uh, making the wrong choice and how you handle a spousal benefit on your pension. Um, this one this one rings a real big bell for me because I do have a lot of clients that do have pension benefits and are close to retirement. And, uh, you know, the one thing here is that, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can take a pension. You know, you can take a lump sum. Sometimes you can take a, you know, one life distribution, which means that it only covers one person and then the spouse gets nothing. Um, you could take it where the spouse gets half. I mean, there's a gazillion different ways that you can take it. But the one thing you really have to look at here is income replacement. So if you were to lose that benefit, you know, how do you replace that benefit? And what's the best way to go about doing that? It's amazing. We run a lot of these pension numbers. And if you look at it, a lot of times you can replicate that. You can take the lump sum or you can take a benefit with a spousal benefit. And we're finding a lot of times you're better off just taking your own money I'm finding a lot of times the equivalent is like getting a 5% return on your money. Well, guess what? You can get 5% now, you know, on bonds. So, you know, I think it's something you really got to take a hard look at. But a lot of times with a conservative portfolio, you have a better odds of doing it yourself than actually relying on an insurance company to pay you out. You know, the other issue is Social Security, right? What's the best way to take it? And what we found is there's no hard, fast rule of thumb for the way everyone should take it depending on the age of you and your spouse. There's a lot of variables to make sure that you make the right decision for you and your spouse. And you know what's interesting is sometimes what makes sense for you doesn't always make sense for your spouse. So you have to look at that as well when you're looking at your overall planning. You know, I have a couple who, a wife has been retired for a very long time, and she's, she's only 62, and she was, had no idea she could take Social Security already because her husband was still working. So what makes sense for her may not have made sense for him at that moment. Yeah, that's true, Frank. The other thing you got to look at is longevity. You know, if you've got if you've got longevity in your family, you know, maybe in some cases it, it makes sense for one spouse to wait. Yeah, that's true. And I'll tell you what, I've, I've been surprised because um, I've dealt with other government agencies that weren't quite as friendly. But the Social Security Department is the most friendly user um, government agency I've ever worked with. So it makes sense for everyone, you know, to get their benefit statement online and also to actually visit a social security office and go over your benefits. Uh, you, you may not be aware of what you're entitled to. That's so true, Bob. I actually just spoke with someone the other day who had no clue about the spousal uh, portion of a social security. So they knew that his wife got this mount, he got this mount. And I was like, well, does it make more sense for her to collect off your half, your, your, your benefit? <laughs> yeah. And they had no idea that was even a question to ask. Well, you know, when I was your age, I didn't think I would even receive Social Security. I thought it would be bankrupt. Um, and we actually, you know, when we have uh, millennials that we run projections for, we don't even include Social Security because the future of it doesn't look so good. But oh, no, no. my generation, we're, we're, we're taking as much as we can get. <laughs> Typical but, for a baby boomer. But uh, my guess is we'll get it, but we'll be like 80. So it's just going to be pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. The other interesting thing I would say, the dynamic <laughs> that happens when you get a couple together and you run projections is a lot of times the risk uh, allocation for each spouse is way different or the risk uh, profile i should say is way different you have one spouse who just like wants to grow the money be super aggressive 
And then you have another spouse who's like, I just want to keep my money in cash, which it's really important to balance in both couples' uh, perspective of risk. I only have one thing to say about this, guys. I mean, it's the old expression, opposites attract. Boy, is that so true when it comes to financial planning with the average couple. That is so true. And I just looked this up recently. One of like the number one reasons for divorce is is this issue right here. Not agreeing on financial situations, not having the same type of financial mindset. So I think maybe don't get divorced first because that's also expensive. <laughs> but <laughs> but just communicate, you know, talk about that a little bit and really get an idea of something that you can find a balance yeah. between between both. You know, I, we're not we're not just financial advisors here. We're also uh, couples therapists because a lot of times I find to Frankie's point where we're doing these annual reviews, there's a lot of contentious uh, uh, couples arguments that come out when we're talking about uh, what, what we're going to do with the money, how we're going to handle it. And, you know, actually the, the big one is is who's spending more. That's uh, <laughs> that's always a fun one. I, and I've, I've gotten very good at uh, learning how to uh, to change the topic. Well, it can get really uncomfortable too when you're going through the budget and then the one spouse is like, really, you spent money on that? <laughs> and uh, you can feel the tension in the room. And that's why we actually put a couch in our office so it is like couple therapy when you come into paying capital management for a review. <laughs> well, and that just goes to show you that, the, you know, the average couple is like the average couple. Everybody has a different perception of risk, a different perception of what a budget should look like. Um, you know, no one can calculate in their in their mind, you know, what inflation does to your purchasing power over your lifetime. So the key is, is to make sure that every couple does a financial plan that they see the projections because you can't you can argue semantics you can argue what if scenarios but you know you can't argue black and white right if it prints out and it's in the red you're going to run out of money so you know it helps to bring those risks and those you know emotions into perspective when you're able to look at a projection which I think everybody should look at at least once a year. So wait, Dad, you're saying red's bad? Red's bad, Chris. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah, okay. Green is good, especially if you're an Eagles fan like Frankie and I. Go birds. Got my green on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's not quite Kelly Green, Frank, but we'll take it. No, that's true. You know, and, and uh, um, you know, one thing, I and this is really not necessarily financially related, but, it, you know, it all ties in. It's like also having a plan for what you're going to do in retirement. Um, you know, I bring this up a lot with my clients because one of the things that – I see is that for folks that retire, you know, with no plan and really nothing to do, you know, a lot of times you're seeing health issues come up a lot more quickly. Um, you know, you're seeing issues of depression, anxiety, you know, you, we're, we're not designed to sit around and do nothing. You know, we're designed for accomplishment. You got to find something to do. You can't just sit idle. Chris, I totally disagree with you, man. I think I'm perfectly designed to sit on that couch, relax. <laughs> while my, uh... That's the real reason we have the couch. <laughs> Ryan's <laughs> nap time. <laughs> And you know I've what, never, Ryan? I've never you taken a nap on that couch. Practice does make perfect, and you're well practiced at sitting. By the way, I've never taken a nap on that couch ever. I swear, never. <laughs> yeah. When no one's in the office, I never fall asleep on that couch. Well, this is this is this is the podcast is now called the Pain Points of BS. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a good friend, a client of mine's a divorce attorney, he says that uh, <laughs> a lot of cause of divorce is retirement. Right. All of a sudden, they're spending a lot more time together than they did during their working years. And uh, suddenly they discover they don't really like each other. Oh, so he said it's, <laughs> you know, you really do have to have a plan, especially to get out of the house and, and to have some time alone like you did while you were in your working years. Yeah, I think to kind of sum up in a, in a way, it's just like it's so critical to do your planning together. Like when we sit down with one spouse and it's not, uh, you know, collective type of teamwork or situation or something like that, it, it can be a big problem. And this is the kind of problems that arise from that. I absolutely agree with that. I think um, what ends up happening in the household, and I noticed in my own household, is that, you know, everyone has their own tasks and they have their own chores. But I think this is something that affects you so much that even if one spouse is, you know, the primary person, the, you know, the key person, I think at least once a year to, to Chris's point, once a year, you have to sit down, you have to be familiar with your plan. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, no, no days are promised and you have to understand how your finances are going to cover both of your lives. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, it took, four, it took fewer than five hours for the jury weighing charges against Sam Bankman-Fried to convict him on all seven counts, including fraud and conspiracy. That was much quicker than other high-profile white-collar crime convictions, including Theranos' Elizabeth Holmes. Man, he must have really been guilty. You know, first of all, I was, I was sitting there watching the... Uh 
the announcer, I was watching the news, and they said, oh, the, the, the jury's coming back. So when you come back in four or five hours, you know that the decision means he's toast. Mm-hmm. And he got convicted on all counts, which he should have, because, you know, his defense was, I didn't commit fraud. I just made bad business decisions. So that's all you have to do now. You steal $10 billion, and you say, oh, I just made bad <laughs> business decisions. Um, but I'll tell you the one thing that I observed was, when, you know, that they can't put any cameras in a courtroom. So you have these, these uh, courtroom artists. <laughs> and, you know, some of them made this guy look like a supermodel, you know, or it looked like a Marvel comic book character, like a super, you know, uh, Marvel uh, superhero. We're where... glad that guy wasn't on the jury, right? He saw oh. him in a different light than everyone. I saw that, Bob. <laughs> yeah. And then, they, you know, some of them draw like, oh, my goodness, does he look that bad? Um, well, you know, the thing that bothers me is Elizabeth Holmes only got 11 years. I mean, she committed an, a huge fraud and, you know, hurt, you know, hurt people's health. Um, and I think she should have got a much bigger sentence, yeah. a longer sentence. And I think, you know, I think he's, uh, he has a potential of 110 years. I think he should get every one of them. Wow, Bob, that's harsh. I don't yes. know. I think that, I don't think you should get married. That's, that's cruel. That's, I think that's too cruel. I think you get, you put him away for 20 years. I mean, he's not made for prison. So even a couple years in prison is enough for that guy, in my opinion. But I can't believe Theranos is Elizabeth only got a Eleven. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. I think the fashion police yeah. would have sent her away for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, burn! Wow, Frankie, cold. <laughs> um, all right, Chris. As of twenty twenty one, more than forty five point three million people living in the U.S. were foreign born, accounting for about one fifth of the world's immigrants. New arrivals for work here: the largest cohort of entries to America, totaling six hundred thirty eight thousand people, or forty one point eight percent of new arrivals. The majority came from neighboring Mexico, which accounted for 55% of incoming workers, was the largest single country of origin. Well, just goes to show you, America's the greatest. Everybody wants to be here. <laughs> it's true. Nicely said, Chris. And it's, uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, even now with our, I don't know what kind of immigration policy we have, but, uh, but we still are probably one of the biggest homes to immigrants around the world, which is actually pretty remarkable. Yep. And an immigrant is nine times more likely to become a multimillionaire than the average uh, you know, a domestically born American. Well, we're screwed now. Thanks a lot, yep. Dad. <laughs> All right, Frank. For the seventh year in a row, recorded music revenues in the United States rose, hitting a record high of fifteen point nine billion. Digital music revenues comprised eighty nine percent of the U.S. music industry's revenue in twenty twenty two. Kind of no surprise. Streaming services like Spotify, Amazon Music, and Apple Music made up eighty four percent of the total industry revenue. For the third, uh, sit again. For the third consecutive year, Puerto Rican rapper Bad Bunny was the most streamed artist at 18.5 billion streams. There's only 8 billion people on the planet. Followed by, no surprise, Taylor Swift, Drake, The Weeknd. And I got to be honest, I don't know who BTS is. They are Jersey a K-pop Yellow. band. They are fantastic. Oh, this is awful. me. This is my playlist. I am doing these streams. <laughs> I don't know that K-pop is. Uh, it's pretty horrible. I'm not gonna. No, lie. it's fantastic. They're so talented and they're wonderful dancers. And it's it's. They have their own sauce at McDonald's. You're missing out. You know you're wow. getting old, and you're like, I don't listen to that noise the kids listen to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know Bob traded in his Led Zeppelin records for Bad Bunny uh, digital downloads. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> How do you feel about Taylor Swift, Frankie? Oh, I love her mother, as we call her. Um, big fan. Loving her relationship with Travis Kelsey. Love the Kelsey podcast. Love it all. It's been a great time to be me. I love the Ares <laughs> tour. I saw the the movie. I cried hysterically. It was oh my wonderful. Goodness. How do you feel about the Dallas Cowboys? Ha- dislike. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> right answer. I think that's, that's the point. <laughs> Frank, thanks for joining us today. Another great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 139, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love it. Give us the support. Give us that five-star ratings on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Tell people how wonderful we are. If this is on Spotify. You can subscribe. This is YouTube right now. You can like this episode. You can actually subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated week, every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.